Hello. Uh, my name is Bogdan Oldakowski. I'm the Secretary General of the Baltic Port Organization, Organization, and I would like to welcome you warmly at our first BPO webinar. Usually, uh, we meet uh, at uh, seminars and conferences that we quite often organize, but during these times, of course, we are not able to do that. From one hand, it's not good that we cannot meet face to face, but from the other hand, it's good that uh, quite many people, more people can attend this webinar. So we're happy to have all of them uh, following the YouTube transmission. Well, in last uh, weeks, uh, we tend to discuss pandemic, coronavirus, crisis, uh, recession, consequences of the situation for ports. But at the same, uh, but at one point, uh, we need to go back to um, to normal agenda, or someone would say new normal agenda. Uh, therefore, we decided to dedicate this webinar to European Green Deal and to discuss what uh, does uh, the, the deal means for the ports. Uh, European Green Deal was presented firstly in November last year, and it was a, a new policy presented by new commission. And uh, the deal is the response to the challenges caused by climate change. Uh, the deal aims to transform EU economy to no net emissions uh, for of greenhouse gases in year 2050. So this is quite ambitious goal. Uh, European Green Deal, of course, addresses also transport, including, including maritime transport, and to some extent ports. Uh, and uh, among others, it, uh, uh, there is an obligation, uh, there will be an obligation uh, to use onshore power supply by ships when when berthing at uh, ports and this part is also uh, very important for ports uh, because they have to be prepared with those installations well uh, today we will hear more about uh, the, the the deal and the consequences for the ports before i, I give the first floor to our first speaker uh, i would like to remind you that, uh, that there is the application on your mobiles that you can use. And with this sub applications, you can uh, vote for two questions uh, asked in the survey sections of the application. And moreover, uh, you can send the questions uh, to us, to moderator and to panelists during the transmission. So very welcome to use uh, the application. Okay. Uh, I would like to now uh, to invite Isabel Rigvost. Isabel, are you with us? Uh, I hope you are OK. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, you will talk, uh, you will give the overview of European Green Deal and also present opportunities for the port sector. But may I ask you at the beginning to say a few words, how is life in Belgium? Uh, are there people on the street? Are you at the office working? or? Or still at home, so please give us a, a few words. Uh, what, what's up in, in Belgium, in Brussels? Um, yes, hello, good morning, Bogdan, and good morning, everyone. Um, as you maybe can see, I'm back in the office, um, not full time, and, and we are gradually, we will start going to the office. We have also an office with enough space and so on. Life is picking up uh, slowly in Belgium, and as good Belgians, if they give us one a bit of freedom, we always use it fully. So we always exaggerate a bit. So it's very tricky for uh, the authorities to to um, to get it right. But um, yeah, we we have been uh, severely hit by Corona. That is a fact. So, uh, okay. Shall I? Okay, Isabel. Thank you for this introduction, and and let's. Uh... Uh, come to uh, our subject of discussion. So please, uh, the floor is yours and you have like seven, eight minutes for your presentation. Please go on. Yeah. Yeah, normally you should see it. Yes, very good. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Let's hope it continues like that. 
So what I wanted to say is um, that the Green Deal is really seen as a very has been seen as a very big moment uh, when it was announced by the the Commission President, and the way it was also announced by the Commission President means, and that brings me to the next slide as well, that it's not just a, an environmental program, it's not just a policy area. But it's really uh, this Green Deal is seen as a new growth strategy for the Commission. And um, it's really uh, mainstreaming, transforming the economy. And it's also presented as transforming the way we produce and consume. Um, I also heard uh, one of the, the big people and the, let's say, the important people in the cabinet of van der Leyen saying it's the, it will frame everything what is happening. Um, so you see it here, and this is a slide uh, from the European Commission. Uh, it has different aspects. I think the word mainstreaming is important because it covers all policies. Uh, financing will be important, leaving no one behind. The social side or also reaching out to also regions of Europe where it might be more difficult. Uh, so this is an important uh, slide, I think. Um, this also says the main points for maritime and ports. Um, so it will be a big a pillar or like a red line through the new white paper, the new transport strategy of uh, the European Commission. What is important that they think about um, extending the emission trading system to maritime. There is a review of the alternative fuel infrastructure directive and the 10T regulation uh, in 2021, a revision of the energy taxation directive. Um, and then there is a new initiative that will regulate the demand is the fuel EU maritime. Um, just the goals, if you announced it already, Bogdan, net zero by 2050. There is also the wish to have an intermediate goal, 50 to 50 55% by 2030. Now in the parliament, they are already wanting to have a revised target for 2030. And they are already wanting in this new climate law and new climate law is in fact a law that enshrines this ambition of the Green Deal. So the Green Deal has a, a, an ambition formulated in a communication. Then the climate law really enshrines this, um, this ambition. Um, we have a lot of question marks because uh, you mentioned it obliged dock ships to use short site electricity. We do not know if that um, implies that ports should also install OPS in all birds. I mean, we do not know. This is probably something that will be regulated in the fuel EU maritime initiative, but it's not very clear. Uh, then um, there is also said in the Green Deal communication, they speak about modal shift of a substantial part of the uh, current 75% road to rail and inland waterways. But, and I think this is very important also for the Baltic region, short sea shipping is not seen as a uh, sustainable um, modal shift, shift alternative. In the meantime, I must say that um, uh, Vice President Timmermans already once mentioned in the Commission uh, Committee, Transport Committee, that he sees also short sea shipping as an alternative. So I think there has been a kind of correction there. What is important uh, for ports is the, the greening of shipping in short sea. Will it become more attractive? And uh, we have the whole discussion about fly shame. So will ferries become more uh, attractive? It will be a game changer for the fossil fuel ports. It can also transform the industry and that has an impact, an indirect impact on ports because ports, they, they are uh, often um, industry hubs. So if the industry, the patterns are uh, changing, then also this will change the ports. Um, we could also see a transformation of consumption patterns uh, by more local, so impact on distribution. Um, and then we, we see it now also with the COVID crisis, but, but the, green, the green debate can also um, uh, enhance this relocation. 
um, it can be a, an opportunity for ports who are energy hubs also because they can play a bigger role. Not only you have the oil ports and so on, but also in renewables, there can be this important role. Um, and then um, ports can take up a, a very active role, a more active role. We see that ports have become landlord ports for the classical role of charging and discharging. But in all these new energy solutions, we see that they take a more active role. And also circular economy will be enhanced and is important for port. As proposition on Green Deal, let not, let's not go here into detail because I think we can discuss it in the debate. Uh, what we have been pushing for, and also Andreas mentioned it, there is no one size fits all. So we go for a goal-based approach, be, be, be strict on the goals, but leave some room for, for technology neutral, neutrality so that you can develop a roadmap with the stakeholders, with the energy providers and so on, and see what is the best solution for, for your port or for this part of your port, for this segment of your traffic and for another segment. We, of course, uh, ask for... Um, tax exemptions, and this is related to the review of the Energy Taxation Directive for all clean fuels and technologies. Uh, we also want, of course, modal shifts to short sea shipping and even to pipelines. We also see a role for pipelines and we may be also important. We, we think walk the talk, so we need a strong budget. And here talking about budget, this is a very complicated slide, but you see that in the EU, EU budget, there was, and this is what was before the COVID crisis, um, you see uh, quite some money for climate and environment. And then you see this just transition mechanism where also quite some money is foreseen to help the regions that, is, that had, have more steps to make uh, to come into this greening, into this decarbonization, um, um, to, to meet the aims, let's say, uh, they will get support. Also, for instance, uh, regions with more additional uh, uh, um, sectors, coal and so on, also with linked employment to that, they can then receive uh, more support. But what is important, and it was mentioned we, uh, at, uh, in the introduction, uh, Bogdan, the COVID-19 uh, is something that walked in between for some in the beginning. For the last months, also here in ESPO, we have been working almost exclusively on COVID. Um, and we have a bit before COVID, uh, it was Green Deal, Green Deal, Green Deal. So what is Green Deal after COVID? Um, but very quickly, we see Green Deal plus COVID leads to green recovery. So there is a new plan and uh, a recovery plan, and the Green Deal is really part of that. Uh, we see it with the, also what uh, President von der Leyen has presented last week to the European Parliament. So we, she says, in this recovery, we can uh, lay the cornerstone for a union which is climate neutral, digital, and more resilient than ever before. Climate neutral is the new Green Deal. Digital is another um, highlight of, of this new commission. And more resilient is that um, the EU would be stronger in their productions, less dependent of China, and so on. Also, Vice President Franz Timmermans says it's not a luxury, but a lifeline. We have a recovery plan with an extra 750 billion. And I just, because it's very fresh, and we, we, are, we didn't go yet into the details and so on, but what is maybe important that the just transition mechanism, so what I explained to you to, to help the most affected regions uh, in this transition, there will be a proposal to strengthen that with extra money, 40 uh, billion euro, what is also important that there would be in the new budget an extra one and a half billion for connecting Europe facility. But we also have to see that the military mobility budget in CEF has been reduced. So we have a bit more in the general, and this will always be very much linked to, to greening and to green deal. Then how to finance, that is also important that they already count 10 billion a year from the extension of ETS 
to maritime and aviation, and that they also count on revenues from a carbon border adjustment mechanism. This is a mechanism to um, uh, take away, uh, to, to see that there is a level playing field between the industries and production that, has, that is being done here in the EU uh, in alignment with the climate objectives and with products that come in from outside the EU and which, do not, which are not produced in a way uh, following the same um, obligations. So it, this is a kind of carbon-free com, com for coming into Europe with certain products. This is important because also in itself, it might uh, influence trade and so the business of uh, ports. So that is my introduction and I'm happy that the presentation went on. Isabel, thank you very much for, uh, for this overview, also for presenting the budget, uh, EU budget. I remember that discussion about budget already started in year, I think, 2018, and we are still not having the, the final uh, budget for next period. So hoping that uh, the budget, uh, EU budget uh, for new period will be ready within next month, probably. Yeah. Okay. Isabel, you will stay with us for the panel discussion. So please join us for the panel. But uh, we would also invite uh, our next yes. speaker. And uh, okay. I hope Andreas is there. Andreas, are you there? I'm here. Hello, Bogdan. And hello. And are you ready to, to give your presentation? I am. Okay. I very am good. indeed. Let's see. Uh, very good. So uh, let's have the presentation, a case study uh, from Port of Helsinki. And I would like to, to invite Andrea Slotter, who is uh, the head of uh, sustainable development uh, department in Port of Helsinki. Uh, and Andreas, if you can also say a few words, how the situation in Helsinki, uh, have you started the, the passenger traffic uh, already? And, and uh, how is the the situation on streets and, and are you at the office or are you working uh, at home please tell us a few words yeah uh yeah hello everyone uh and greetings from helsinki no no i'm not at the office we still have recommendations in place to 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 work from from home uh unless absolutely necessary but life is is coming back to normal very slowly in in uh helsinki and finland and uh, there are people uh in the streets and and uh, a lot of restrictions have been been lifted but yeah it has been a, a pretty grim couple of months for for the ports of course with with a lot of, of uh, turnover from passenger traffic but uh, if we want to find some good news from up here in the north i would say at least summer is coming okay okay and uh, yes so please go on with your presentation uh and uh, you have like seven eight minutes please this is good. And I hope you can see my screen now. Yes. Very good. So yes, hello everyone. Uh, once again, Andreas Lotte from uh, Helsinki. I'm appearing on your screens today to give you a, a port's perspective in a little bit of a case setup on some concrete actions that, that we've taken uh, because of the challenges the global warming and the ensuing climate change poses to us all. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the port of Helsinki, we're the largest port in Finland. And um, uh, we're also the largest passenger port in Europe, uh, a fact that has had slightly more negative connotations lately because of the crisis. Um, our new strategy was finalized last year. We stated ambitions to becoming forerunners in sustainability issues. The implementation is, uh, of the strategy is well underway and, and with the ambitious actions plan we have created, I, I do feel confident we will indeed be perceived as, as forerunners. The action plan for our sustainable development work has many sub-projects and each is more important than the other. There is, however, one particular set of challenges that we attribute importance to beyond the others, and that is carbon neutrality. The Paris Accord of 2015 states that global average temperature increase must be kept below 2 degrees centigrade. 
And for this to be possible, the way everything over the globe uh, is being done today must be reflected on and possibly rethought. And it's specifically about the Port of Helsinki's work towards this carbon neutrality that I want to talk to you today. Um, to really quickly sum up our goals, achieving 100% carbon neutrality in own operations is uh, easy. You reduce the energy you use, uh, that's mainly electricity and heat uh, in our case, through different energy saving measures. And then you buy from renewable sources for the still remaining energy demands. Voila. And the forerunner part, however, comes from going above and beyond just our own emissions. Um, we want to decrease all emissions in the harbor area, not just emissions from our own operations. We left our program a, a, a work in progress in the sense that new technologies can and will be brought in if and when they become available. But even though they were, we're sure that the future will bring new efficient technologies, we also cannot sit back and wait for that. Action is needed now. In the chart, you'll, you'll see that last year, 80% uh, uh, of our in-harbor emissions in Helsinki were produced by vessels. It's therefore natural that a lot of our efforts um, will be concentrated on doing what we can to, to help the shipping companies becoming even more effective more in, both in and out of harbor. I will also be focusing on this slice of the cake in this presentation. So, dear listeners, uh, we've set the stage, we've cast the actors, and now all that remains is to take action. Our sustainability objectives are ambitious, but they are also realistic. They do, however, require concrete actions to actually accomplish anything. Uh, the objectives are an integral part of our management model to make sure our personnel, our partners, and all our stakeholders are working together and are equally committed to a sustainable future. There are multiple technologies that can be used to minimize emissions in port. Uh, onshore power solutions uh, is one. And later this year, we'll have our next uh, OPS facility operational in the South Harbor. Um, next year, uh, we're going to have the next one operational in West Harbor for the Helsinki Tallinn traffic. And the year after that, the fir first cruise vessel connection will be available in the Hernesade cruise area. Auto mooring system uh, you might have heard of, it's a robot mooring system for vessels. It saves a lot of time and it has proved very satisfactory. Uh, and the time that you save in harbor is time that you can use to steam slower and therefore reduce fuel burn on the voyage. Uh, the emission reduction can actually be quite significant. When with your own actions, you help someone uh, reduce their carbon footprint, uh, uh, there's a term called a carbon handprint. Uh, which is positive. Um, overall, you can say that investments into making import operations as effective and smooth flowing as possible uh, are, are some of the ways in which a port can really have a positive effect on emissions. It all comes down to efficiency. A minute saved is a minute earned. Uh, the electrification of our society is, of course, an ongoing increasingly strong trend. And this year, as I said, we'll have our second OPS operational in the heart of the city, as you can see in the picture. It doesn't get much more central than that. And this case is as good as they come, let me tell you. We have traffic to the berth every day with two sister vessels alternating. Uh, they both already have the installed uh, equipment uh, on board, and they spend around seven hours each day at the quayside. The vessels are relatively large passenger vessels which means a, a rather large hotel load. Another huge advantage is that we don't face the dreaded frequency challenge. In this case, we don't need a frequency converter at all. Our investment comes in at around 1.8 million euros, but this does not include the investments uh, needed by the power grid company outside the harbor area and also not the shipping company's investments. Now, greenhouse gas emissions might be our main focus, but the marginal benefits of installing OPS in such a central locations are, of course, also huge. Quality of air, noise levels are also improved, uh, even though they are actually at a very good level already. This is news that is excellent for our neighbors and, of course, also for strengthening our social license to operate in the heart of the capital. Now, preventing global warming and, and reducing emissions has, of course, been recognized as being very important in the world. But over the years, there still have been very little commitment in the form of concrete action. 
the reason for slowness of action is at least to some extent a perceived clash between environmental and economic issues as well as in some cases uh, different perceptions of the calculation of emissions and their impact or rather lack thereof. In our own carbon neutrality program, business value and emission reductions are not pitted against each other. We see that some of the emission reduction measures might not, not be economically viable when analyzed in a vacuum, but they can nonetheless make a lot of sense when they are viewed in a broader perspective. I said that this particular case um, is as good as they come, and I, I stand by that statement. Even so, this awesome case doesn't really make total sense if scrutinized strictly in a traditional uh, return on investment type of setting. Um, I'm proud of, of Port of Helsinki for going ahead with this and, and many more sustainable investments, uh, especially so during trying times like these. So to wrap up um, uh, a few conclusions and, and uh, maybe lessons learned. First of all, emission sources. There, there's an old proverb that tells us that if it can be measured, it can also be improved. And this is, of course, also true for emissions. You need to know what you're dealing with to be able to take the first step. When you know your emissions and their relative size, you can figure out exactly where to start, where to get the most impact, uh, where to get the most bang for your buck. When you've figured those things out, you can, uh, then you, of course, must decide what to actually do. And this, in turn, depends on your specific situation. A solution that is good for me and my port uh, and my port's particular needs is not necessarily good for you. There is unfortunately no silver bullet to solve everyone's challenges immediately. And I think OPS is a good example of this. It does make a lot of sense in some places, but not in all. One size does in fact not fit all. As I said, even the best cases or proposed actions are not necessarily wonderful investments when calculating NPV, but is this NPV calculation really the best way to evaluate investments of, of this type? The NPV calculation, of course, measures the value of, of future cash, fl cash flows to the shareholder, and it's, it's a very, very useful metric indeed. For sustainably functioning companies, it, it's, it's very important to make sure that also your business decisions are sustainable in the long run. But maybe it's time to, to look at value to shareholders differently. Um, I don't have a new formula to share with you, uh, but I think shareholder value as a concept needs to be viewed differently in the future. There are more dimensions to value than just the almighty euro or dollar or krona. Thank you for your attention. Uh, happy to answer questions later and please uh, contact me if you wish to continue the discussion later. Thank you. And Thank you very much, Andreas, for, for, for this uh, presentation, giving the case study from Helsinki. Uh, maybe in mid-time, because I've got one question uh, from audience. In fact, it's dealing with your last uh, conclusion. Have you included uh, stakeholders when defining the goals of 30% reduction uh, from harbor activities, reduction of CO2? Have you discussed these goals with your stakeholders? Yeah, yes, we have uh, uh, very thoroughly, I should, uh, I should add. Um, as I said, they, they are uh, ambitious goals, but they, they are also realistic. But, but you know, targeting emissions from, from heavy machinery, uh, heavy traffic in the harbor area, it, uh, it, it's not easy, but, uh, but we're sure it's, it is doable. But it's definitely not doable unless you involve everyone and get everyone on the, on the same page. But, uh, but fortunately, you know, everyone is already uh, working in the same direction. So it's, it's just a matter of, of uh, coordination, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you stay with us. Uh, yes, definitely. Thank you. But uh, we would also have uh, two other speakers. Uh, I would like to introduce to you uh, Ellen Kasik, Quality and Environmental Manager from Port of Tallinn. Ellen, are you with us? Yes, I am. Greeting from Estonia and Tallinn. Nice to hear you. <laughs> Good to have you with us. And, and just uh, a few uh, introduction words. How is life in, in Tallinn? Uh, are you at the office? Are you at the home? 
and what's uh, going on in, in Estonia? Uh, the life is pretty the same like in Finland, uh, which uh, Andres mentioned, and uh, Isabel in Belgium. And we are, I am in, in the office just now, but uh, not all of us are in the office. So we are slowly moving uh, to back to normal life. And uh, when it, uh, it comes to passengers, so we have drastic um, uh, decrease of passengers uh, in, in our terminals, but now it's slowly going, going back. So, and, uh, and, and we hope, the, we hope that situation will be normal as soon as possible, but we, we have to work hardly on that. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, I will give you a floor and ask some questions uh, in a few minutes, but I would like to ask if Agnieszka Zapłatka is with us. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning from Belgium. <laughs> and how is life in, in Belgium? Are you at the European Commission building or at, at home? No, most of the Commission colleagues and myself, we are working from home offices. Uh, so only small amount of uh, colleagues can uh, go back to, to their offices uh, and that's under con condition that we are not going to meet each other and see each other. Uh, so, um, but the work from, from office, from, from home is quite, uh, going quite well, so, uh, so here, here everything is, is okay. Um, the life in Belgium, as Isabel already explained, is slowly going back to normal. Um, there are more and more people on the streets uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's summer. It's a pity because it's the most sunny uh, spring in history and oh. we are at home. Surprising. Um, it's also in quite uh, nice weather in Poland nowadays. Mm -hmm. but it's not very hot, it's, it's just uh, fine. It's a bit, uh, I wouldn't say cold, but it's, it's a bit chilly. Okay, uh, Agnieszka, may, may I start with you? Uh, because uh, Isabel just said that uh, uh, the life uh, is, is divided into two parts. Uh, and the second one is the Green Deal after COVID. Uh, Green Deal before COVID and Green Deal uh, after COVID. And I'd like to ask you, uh, will the European Commission treat uh, European Green Deal as less of priority due to the impact uh, of COVID and, and, and uh, other priorities? So please, uh, if you can describe that. Um, maybe I'll introduce myself very briefly uh, because I'm coming from the Directorate General for Research and Innovation, uh, it, which is part of the European Commission, of course. Um, and I'm dealing with waterborne uh, transport research. Uh, so from the perspective of uh, the European research, uh, Green Deal is still uh, very high on the agenda. And also um, when you listen to, to uh, the leaders of the European Commission, um, President von der Leyen and uh, Vice President Timmermans, they are both referring to um, Green Deal being in the heart of the recovery plan. Uh, and if you read the uh, recovery communication uh, from last week, it also underlines that uh, green transition is um, part of the recovery uh, package. It's a very important part of this recovery package. So um, I don't think that uh, the green transition is going to, uh, to, to slow down really. Uh, it should be con considered part of uh, this measure. And also from the research and innovation point of view, um, in context of the waterborne transport, uh, it is being considered a vital part. Uh, you may uh, know that uh, last year um, there was a decision to, to start uh, preparations of the uh, zero emission waterborne transport partnership 
uh, for the uh, Horizon uh, Europe, the next research and innovation program. Um, this is part of this big um, environmental package. So, uh, as I said, it's, it's a very important uh, and high on the agenda part of recovery. Thank you very much. I have another question, maybe a, a bit shorter one. Um, European Commission for many years uh, supported LNG as the uh, clean fuel and they supported the, uh, the installations, the, the deployment of uh, infrastructure for LNG bunkering in ports. When you read uh, Green Deal, um, the gas, the LNG is not the priority. Uh, anymore? Can you can you comment that? What what we can expect when it comes to uh, LNG? Many ports uh, uh, counted on LNG as a, as a new fuel for shipping, and now what 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 uh, the ports should uh, should do about it in light of uh, European Green Deal? Please. Yes. Uh, okay. So of course the Green Deal is about climate neutrality. LNG is a fossil fuel and uh, also is not the solving the, the question of uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, due to the impact of uh, the methane sleep. Uh, but uh, it has advantages, of course, for um, local air emission um, reduction and impacts quite, quite significantly. Uh, and it's also still a part of uh, the legislation, uh, the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive. Uh, it still um, refers to, to, to LNG uh, for, for ports uh, and, and infrastructure at ports. Um, therefore, it's it's still part uh, of uh, the package. Uh, it still can be considered uh, as um, a the transition towards uh, the, the, the zero emission. Um, perhaps it will be less um, emphasized uh, for, for the future, in particular in context of the other mix. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's uh, it is something that is available uh, currently um, as no other alternative fuels uh, it really is. Although uh, from the research and innovation point of view, we will be focusing mainly on um, other alternative uh, fuels, in particular those which uh, have. Uh, will have less uh, uh, side impacts, environmental impacts. Uh, currently, we are not limiting ourselves in the research to specific type of fuel. Um, so, so the package is quite broad. Um, the hydrogen is uh, on the agenda. Fuel cells, fuel cells can use uh, uh, liquefied natural gas. Um, uh, to, to, to extract hydrogen. Therefore, yeah, it's, 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 it's still part of the, uh, of the package. Agnieszka, thank you very much. Um, yes, when it comes to, to hydrogen, uh, I think uh, now hydrogen, hydrogen is very much supported by, by uh, policymakers. And, and uh, let's see if, if this fuel can be used by shipping in the future. Ellen, I would like to come uh, back to you. And uh, I have a question. Uh, of course, uh, you have studied European Green Deal, deal and, and I would like to ask you uh, if there is or if there will be any, any consequences uh, of this deal, of this policy paper for uh, Port of Tallinn. Are you planning any special development, any special uh, investments when it comes to meeting uh, the goals of European uh, Green Deal, please. Yeah, thank you, Bogdan, for the question. Uh, the short answer is that uh, we at the Port of Tallinn are uh, confident that the fundamentals have uh, no, not changed. 
and uh, we will continue with our uh, uh, sustainable uh, sustainability goals and uh, uh, on the same uh, roadmap. But uh, for answering uh, uh, your question, let me uh, let give me uh, a chance to give you a short, a very brief overview of the of this uh, situation in our port before the uh, COVID health uh, crisis. So last year, uh, the port of Tallinn designed uh, its own short-term and uh, long-term sustainable development strategy, uh, which aligns our priorities uh, with uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I will try to share with you uh, the uh, uh, um, one of uh, uh, our one pager and uh, it's easy to describe it because um, uh, better better to show one slide is it is it visible now is it okay do you see it Bogdan uh, do you see this yeah well, I cannot see it now uh, no Okay. No, sorry for that. Yeah, it is starting. Okay, but uh, no, no. Is it okay? Can you see this uh, one picture? Uh, well, I, I, I'm seeing uh, a slide. Yes. Yes, it's uh, only one slide. Yeah, 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 yeah. about sustainable development and uh, and uh, and how it's implemented to, uh, in United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It's only one slide, but I I, I have it uh, uh, better better to uh, to show than describe all this SD, SDG as, as you see. And uh, the, our priorities uh, uh, in Port of Tallinn uh, are clean air, clean Baltic Sea energy efficiency and sustainable use of natural resources. So I, I will repeat what was uh, uh, what uh, Andreas and Isabel told before, what is uh, the real pri priorities and the same are in Port of Tallinn also. So uh, uh, we committed to continue with the, uh, this uh, initiative in the field of sustainable development and uh, what are the uh, the most important the initiatives that I would like to uh, uh, share with you. First of all, digitalization project, the smart port traffic management system, which is in Port of Tallinn in Old City Harbor already in use. Uh, uh, this, this, uh, the next uh, step is carbon footprint mapping, which we start this year as because it's important to know uh, where we are now and what we are starting to to decrease uh, the CO2 impact. So I would like to emphasize that uh, we uh, are mapping the whole port activities, including shipping, industry, and cargo handling operations. So it's it's quite uh, uh, difficult and uh, uh, it's not easy task. Uh, also, what is what is very important is taking heavy cargo vehicles and cars out of the city center. It's one of the projects. Also, air monitoring and uh, creating onshore power supply uh, system for ferries in Old City Harbor, in our passenger harbor. Uh, installing uh, automating automating mooring system in the same passenger harbor, and also implementation of environmentally uh, differentiated port use based on uh, ESI index. I should say that last year we gave an ESI index uh, based discount uh, for more or less 20% of all port calls, so quite, quite a lot uh, um, present for shipping and support for shipping lines. Um, also, to contributing to the cleaner Baltic Sea by helping prevent the discharge of waste from ships into the sea. It's very important. And uh, the Port of Tallinn have adequate capacities uh, for receiving any kind of waste from the ship, cooling our harbors. 
and uh, and I, I should say that uh, we have more than 90% of the ship generated waste and were refused reused in the circle uh, circular economy um, mm, what is also very important priorities for us is increased energy efficiency and, and uh, fostering to use uh, renewable energy. And for example, in planning buildings and infrastructure, we use uh, digital uh, building information modeling uh, for improving the functionality of the facilities and implementing sustainable solutions as, as early stage uh, as uh, uh, in the design phase. And also our new cruise terminal, which is to be completed uh, next year, will use seawater for heating and cooling and uh, receive supplementary electricity from solar panel. Uh, in addition, I would like to share with you um, uh, very latest news. And it's, it's, it was good to, to hear that Agnieszka and also uh, Isabel uh, mentioned hydrogen as a fuel. So as you probably know, Port of Tallinn has the subsidiary uh, uh, operating ferry traffic between Estonia and uh, mainland and the island. And we are starting, starting with a new project to design the new environmentally friendly vessel. And one of the technologies uh, what we are considering uh, uh, using is vessel with hydrogen as a fuel. It's very expensive, of course, we know, but, uh, but we, are, we are starting with this project uh, with design. But on the other hand, uh, it's expensive, but uh, it's one of the best solutions to meet climate ne neutrality. So mm, to summarize the answer on the question, uh, Bogdan, uh, uh, I can say that the Port of Tallinn is committed to continue with the initiative uh, and uh, in the field of sustainable development. And in my opinion, the first country uh, to go green will gain the most. So I'm sure that uh, the first will gain and the last will pay. So that's, that's, that's all on this question. Helen, thank you very much and thank you for, uh, for this uh, summary at the end. Uh, yes, maybe I can go now to Isabel. Isabel, there is a question to you from audience. So maybe I can start with that. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the question is, do you really think that uh, European Green Deal will change anything? How does it differ from the previous strategies? Uh, yeah, I think I, I think it will change because I mean we we have had the the the, the climate issue is not anymore uh, uh, an, an issue of of uh, environmentalists of environmental managers. It's really it has been a number one uh, topic and it will remain so. Of course, I've said COVID has changed a bit the attention and so on, and has pushed a bit the the the. The climate issue out of the, the general debates, but we see at, at policy level it's part of the of the general debates. So in every debate, I also see it in the parliament and so on. Climate is really everyone is pushing. It's not anymore something of of a, of a green party or whatever. It's something in there is this green agenda, this decarbonization agenda in all political groups, for instance. Uh, all leaders are really on this greening. And um, so I, I really think there is, um, if you put these goals and you put it in all layers of, of the economy, not only at the ports and the shipping, but also the industry and so on, it must lead to, to, to new patterns of, of living um, and, and hopefully also to new opportunities. I mean, yeah, so okay. I, I'm, I'm convinced. But, uh, but it will be challenging because that is the thing. I think the budget is uh, is certainly important, and there we should really be firm because we so should say if this is a policy priority, then walk the talk. Then also the European budget should should reflect it and and have uh, enough attention for for meeting these goals. Thank you, Isabel. I have another question to you. 
uh, which is uh, a bit connected to the previous one. What are the necessary steps uh, for ports, uh, other maritime stakeholders, in order to, to meet uh, uh, and, and in order to implement the goals and decarbonization of industry uh, for the next year? So if you could... Uh, um, this is, um, we, I must say that it's quite early day and not. Um, we have the, the ambition from uh, expressed in the, in the Green Deal, but we are now waiting. There are two uh, important initiatives that are in preparation. That is the review of the AFIT, the, the Clean Fuel Infrastructure Directive, and then the Fuel EU Maritime, uh, which will regulate the use of, of clean fuels. Uh, and where we, we think there might be something like uh, the obligation for shipping lines to use OPS. So uh, a lot will depend on that. Um, we will have to, to, to prepare and I mean to see that the infrastructure is there and so that we, we can, on the one hand, the, the greening of shipping is, I think it's the, the, the first, we think it's the first responsibility of the shipping line. But as ports, we will have to facilitate it. At the same time, we should also not forget that Green Deal is not only about decarbonization, but it's also about pollution, about air emissions. And there we are in a big debate. Um, uh, we know that every port is in a big debate with its stakeholders, and there is really, really this call for clean air. And their ports um, must see that in the port area, the air emissions go down. And so, try to, to, to contribute as much as possible. So I think what is very important, we, we have to see, because we ask the, the EU policymakers not to go for, not to choose a technology too much, but to go for this goal-based approach. So that, and then if we would have that, then I think what port should do is really connect, make these coalitions with the customers, with the energy providers, and try to make a deal for a certain um, technology and so on. So if you install OPS, you install it because there is an engagement of the user to use it. Um, you have also connections with the energy provider to see that the grid is green and so on. So you really have to make a business case. I think some of the, the, the people, the ports here in the debate can, can also maybe give their views on that. But this is, I think, what is important to do. And what I also would think is that European ports should be very, very active in trying to get the EU funding that will be there for this greening. Um, it will be there, but we will have to watch out and be very alert to, to get some of the money. Isabel, thank you very much. Uh, I think we are uh, about to finish in a, in a few minutes, but before we end this session, I'd like to ask everybody from the panel about the biggest challenges when implementing uh, uh, the goals of European Green Deal. So Agnieszka, what are the, the main challenge uh, you, you can expect? And please, short answer. I think the biggest challenge will be to um, uh, overcome um, or, or to, to put together, to streamline various interests of different parts of the uh, maritime or uh, what maritime transport industries. Uh, we have on one hand uh, short sea shipping, on the, one, on the second hand uh, long distance shipping, um, you know, shipbuilding. Uh, Various various parts uh, which interests uh, should be somehow coordinated towards the, the same uh, direction. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. The same question to you. Main challenge for implementing uh, yeah. deal. Uh, thank you. Uh, in my in my understanding, the uh, main challenge is. Uh, ship de decarbonization and of course uh, the ports will have to help them to do it uh, different incentives and uh, differentiated port use OPS etc another is uh, uh, alternative fuel as I told hydrogen I think how how to deal with that it's very important and uh, because it's the main fuel which reduce CO2 uh, uh, really 
and uh, financing. So good to, good news from uh, from ESPO and uh, European Commission. Uh, but uh, financing plays an extremely important role. And uh, so new generation EU, or as Isabel uh, mentioned, the green recovery uh, uh, are quite optimistic. So therefore, I would like, uh, I, I think that the term deal, uh, European deal, is in fact very well chosen. So since realizing this objective, will require cooperation between policymakers, uh, ports, and uh, stakeholders. So that's my opinion. Thank you. And Isabel, please, uh, short answer. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think the, 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 the money is a, a big one. And uh, we, we must have, because what I explained to the recovery plan from the Commission is a proposal. It has to get the agreement of the EU member states, of the Council, we know that some are a bit more reluctant to 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 give um, to to boost to have this boosting recovery plan. So we hope hope uh, that there comes an agreement there. Um, and what I think is also important is to we will have to define the new normal after COVID and bring that in line with the green deal because it might change some things which impact also the green deal. Thank you very much, Isabel. Uh, there is a short question. Uh, to Ellen from audience, uh, can I ask how big is the vessel and what is the distance it travel and speed? Uh, I think the question is about this hydrogen vessel. So, Ellen. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's uh, so late news that we we only starting to uh, to design and think. So it's uh, it's no, no answer on this question because it's under the uh, investigation. And, uh, and of course, we are, uh, when we will receive some uh, information and uh, we, we will uh, share it with audience. So it's only announced and I would like to, to, to share this, that uh, information that we are doing, we are thinking about that. And because it's, uh, it's, it's the fuel of, uh, of the future. Ellen, thank you very much. Um, I think there are some more questions, but, but maybe we will try to facilitate in order to, uh, to send these questions, to pass these questions to, to panelists, because we are running out of time. Uh, as I said, there was also a survey among the attendees, and, uh, and they were asked what are the biggest challenges for implementing of, of the uh, Green Deal, and 20% of them said uh, it's it's costly it's it, because the investment are costly uh, the 40 percent said diversity uh, diversity of ports and also 40 uh, percent said that possible lack of cooperation between stakeholders so uh, as we can see many people are expecting also a, a rather important challenges when, when imp uh, implementing the uh, european green deal i would like to thank all the uh, speakers on the on of the uh, speaking part. Also, I would like to thank to Agnieszka, to Isabel, to Ellen for taking part in the panel. Um, and then I think we will have ten minutes break, and we will start another session uh, ten minutes past twelve. So ten minutes break, and we will meet again in ten minutes. Thank you very much, and see you soon. Thank you. The Baltic Ports Organization is a regional ports organization, inspiring and supporting its members while cooperating proactively with relevant partners. Established on October 10, 1991 in Copenhagen, the Baltic Ports Organization is a regional ports organization comprised of 47 members representing the most significant ports and stakeholders in the Baltic Sea region. The organization's mission is to contribute to sustainable economic, social, and environmental development of maritime industry in the BSR. At the beginning of the Baltic Ports Organization in 91, and the years after, the main reason for BPO was to transfer know-how from Western type of ports to Eastern type of ports from Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. Nowadays, the challenge is quite different. We are more discussing about the future of the ports and how to finance the ports development. The BPO is one of the structures that 
along the Baltic Sea, there's a good cooperation between all partners. BPO represents the interests of the Baltic Sea ports, contributes to environmental awareness in the region, organizes dedicated industry meetings, and plays an active role in research and training. I think the Baltic ports are, are for us very important because they are a, a unique set of ports with some particularities on environment, but also uh, geopolitically, and they are uh, front runners. I'm totally convinced that the role of BPO is essential. You represent the region and a number of very important ports that are leaders in many topics that are highly recognized by Brussels and United Europe. BPO has been doing a really great job in promoting and networking Baltic Sea ports. So it has become the voice of the ports around the Baltic Sea. It's very valuable, especially in lobbying important issues for the whole of the sector where one port's voice just isn't strong enough. Clean Baltic Sea is a common uh, goal for most of uh, uh, ports uh, surrounding uh, Baltic Sea. So the Baltic ports uh, uh, can be a good example uh, when it comes to environmental experience. As I told you, we have very strict uh, requirements and uh, in, uh, in our opinion all these requirements should be uh, apply to other ports, other uh, in, in Europe, not only in the Baltic Sea, but uh, worldwide also. The comprehensive ports are very important to maintain the core network, but we, we don't have any success, uh, let's say, getting EU funds. BPO's uh, most important uh, issue is to gather the ports together and uh, educate and explain to uh, the European Union. What's, what, what the comprehensive ports needs actually are. The annual meeting of all the members of the BPO, as well as other participants, the Baltic Ports Conference serves as the ideal place to exchange experiences and knowledge between the stakeholders active in the Baltic Sea region. Being a member of Baltic Ports Organization, it means uh, being a member of huge community. Uh, community of Baltic uh, region. Uh, for us, uh, I mean Port of Szczecin Świnoujście, it's also an organization who can lobby for interests uh, of uh, other ports. BPO will follow the developments in EU institutions related to 10T policy and budgetary decisions will continue to focus on the sustainability priorities. BPO will also facilitate technological development in the Baltic ports as well as carefully follow economic development in order to help Baltic ports in planning their next steps. I would like to welcome you at the uh, second part of our webinar, webinar to, dedicated to the discussion about the impact of European Green Deal for ports. And as I said uh, in, the, in the introduction at the beginning, this is the first time, in fact, we are running uh, such a webinar. And I'm glad that uh, so many of you are attending and following our transmission on YouTube. Uh, well, uh, this part uh, will take uh, a bit less than one hour. We will have uh, two presentations uh, at the beginning and then uh, a panel discussion. Of course, uh, we will uh, still talk uh, uh, about uh, European Green Deal, but in light of what this really means for ports and uh, how uh, onshore power supply uh, may contribute to, to uh, complying with uh, uh, climate change and emission uh, challenges. So let me start with another speaker. Uh, I'd like to invite Emil Arolski. Emil Arolski is Managing Director of Motus Foundation. Uh, Emil, can you say where are you and how do you feel? How is your family and uh, uh, yeah, 
what's going on in Gdansk. <laughs> Uh, yeah, hello uh, everyone and hello Bogdan. Uh, greetings from Dansk. Well, the sun is shining, the traffic is getting back to normal, planes are flying, so we're going back to the office. So I think positives are starting to, to, to show around. Um, and yeah, I'm uh, today presenting uh, from home, but uh, soon we'll be going back to the office. Yeah, and uh, to start with the presentation, Thank you, Emil. Uh, I'd like to welcome also our next speaker for a while, yeah. Thomas Andersson. Thomas is the CEO of the port, Ports of Stockholm. How are you, Thomas? Are you at home? Are you at the office? Uh, how busy you are these days? Hello, hello. Well, I'm, I'm in Stockholm, so greetings from Stockholm, working from home today. Uh, uh, we're fine. We're doing well. We have a lot to do, actually, even if uh, when it comes down to Passenger traffic, uh, that's, that's nothing less than a disaster, but, but uh, we're holding up. We just had this, the first, uh, first trial run to our brand new Port Nuri here last week, and we're going to have the next one tomorrow. So everything is working smoothly for, for Nuri as well. Thank you very much, Thomas. And I know we are busy these days, so thank you so much for, for being with us for, for this session. Emil, I'd like to come back to you and uh, you will give the overview of the onshore power supply uh, uh, infrastructure development in the Baltic Sea region. So I'm looking forward to hear that. And uh, well, you have seven, eight minutes. Please go on with your presentation. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Bogdan. As you mentioned, I'll give you slides on uh, onshore power supply in the Baltic Sea region. Uh, well, I'm representing Motors Foundation. In a no, it's a non-profit organization uh, conducting research, initiating and developing new projects, participating in Safe Horizon Interact projects. And uh, well, onshore power supply, um, OPS, HVCC, uh, cold ironing, shore connection, STS power supply, well, it's all the same. Well, it's a modification of the shore and the vessels to be able the vessels to be able to benefit from a regular power supply from the board. Oh, well, some pros and cons. Uh, the benefits um, naturally are reducing air pollution. Quite a few years back, uh, the only way to uh, deliver this uh, power supply to the vessel was to by turning a diesel power engine. This was connected to lots of uh, emissions of um, air pollution, CO2, sulfur uh, oxide, SOx, NOx, and other ones. And this actually onshore power supply is avoiding all this. So we're reducing noise, reducing all these emissions. Some of the cons and issues with this onshore power supply, it's the investment in the port infrastructure and ship systems. Uh, requires technical knowledge of ships calling for the port highly affected by policies and energy and fuel prices. And some barriers as well, uh, as even we heard earlier today uh, from Andreas from Port of Helsinki, high investment costs and rate of return of investment now, um, and it's, it, it's quite worrying. Still, it's very difficult to, to get profitable in such infrastructure. Uh, cost effectiveness uh, depends on good cooperation between ports and fleet owners and uh, relies also on a national energy mix. Uh, I would like to mention a few policies and regulations which are critical for the development of such infrastructure. If it goes for internationally, the most important regulation of emissions from vessels is a MARPOL convention. And in 2011, the, it was accepted MARPOL Annex 6. Also the nitrogen emission control area, the NECA area was accepted. And um, in 2008, the World Ports Climate Initiative, as well in 2009, started an initiative which is promoting OPS. Well, coming back to the European regulations, we've got a sulfate directive from 2012, which is active from 2015, uh, as well the Clean Power Transport Directive. And as well, naturally, now everyone will be paying attention to the European Green Deal, which we are all expecting and it aims to make Europe climate neutral by 2050. We had a great presentation earlier on from Isabel uh, on this point. Well, going back to the actual OPS and um, systeming technology uh, description. 
to say what makes this um, OPS work. Well, it is the, the transformers um, and basically we've got uh, control panels, we've got power distribution, uh, we've got uh, high voltage bridge to the port, we've got um, connection boxes in different parts of it. There are some examples of, of, of pictures which I gave it there. And in the, on the side of the ship, we've got uh, a retrofitting ships which we will require remodification of the main switchboard and some uh, mechanical alternations as well and, and certification of this installation for sure. Uh, some mobile solution uh, require quick installation um, and mobility of the OPS system and similarly OPS mobile solution can be installed on a newly built uh, ships as well. Um, on this slide, we've included the capacity demand by vessel and vessels and type. Um, example of the OP OPS systems requirements based on ship type and size measured in gross tonnage. So you can see uh, as you go further and higher on the gross tonnage, obviously the power is higher, that it demands more. And naturally, um, it will be more exp expensive. The cost also of the investment of OPS. Uh, is likely to be very different from one port to another. It mainly depends on the ship type, the power requirements, and basically the higher the power demand is, the more expensive will be the, the, the infrastructure. Usually the high voltage mainly is used for ferries and cruise ships and the low voltage OPS is for the, um, the smaller units, so to say, for the other units. The small map here representing the um, OPS infrastructure in the Baltic uh, seaports. Uh, they, they all, within the Baltic seaports, we've got operation on, on a high voltage and a low voltage OPS systems. Over 10 new OPS installations since 2016, we've seen among the ports in the Baltic. Uh, OPS it generally serves for ferry, rural, rollback stacks, oil product tankers, and cruise ships as well. We expect a new infrastructure is planned in Port of Oslo, Istad, Helsinki, and Stockholm. Well, as you can see from the, from the map, naturally Sweden has uh, most of the ports we developed HV OPS installations, followed by uh, Finland, and uh, some of the German ports are de developing such infrastructure. On the side of the low voltage OPS, uh, we've got the countries from the Baltic, uh, Baltic Rim countries uh, have uh, such infrastructure and they're planning uh, more OPS to come in the Baltic Rim countries and Poland, including. Uh, well, as well, worth men mentioning um, Norway. Um, it's not within the Baltic Sea region, but it always uh, serves as an example. Uh, good case studies come from there. It has a significant amount of OPS installations. Uh, well, a uh, of slides here with the pictures. Uh, on the left side, we see in the port of Trelleborg, uh, onshore power, power supply there. And uh, on the right hand side, we see an example of a very old uh, OPS system from Port um, Minerby, which is from 1989. The interesting fact in there is that we've got almost 10 cables which was supposed to be connected is 380 volts um, uh, power supply. And it's uh, very time consuming in old times to, to, to attach this. Uh, on this slide, you've got an example of OPS infrastructure from Paul of Kalskrona in Sweden. And it's a fixed, on the left picture, we've got a fixed um, OPS, high voltage OPS system. And on the right hand side on the slide, we've got an OPS from the port of Hamburg. Interesting, interesting fact is that this is the mobile, mobile OPS, OPS um, infrastructure. Okay, and, and moving to the examples of OPS and projects, I would like to give probably is worth mentioning that it is not directly dedicated instrument for supporting the development of OPS uh, system. Uh, there is a safe transport. Um, which the priority motivates the, of the sea, which is directly dedicated, to, not directly de dedicated, but supports such uh, infrastructural projects for, for the ports and currently supporting it uh, quite well. It's the main actually program which uh, gives financial support for such a uh, uh, project. 
And as an example, I'm giving it here, Port of Hienzuki and Port of Tallinn, we have a, a joint project between port project. The project developed um, jointly with the ship owners as well, cost about three and a half million euro. And our main scope is of installing a five OPS uh, supplies in the old city uh, harbor of Tallinn. Well, with that, I uh, would like to conclude the presentation and to inform you the more comprehensive presentation with uh, uh, lots of more information in the actual slides will be available uh, for you to download. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Emil, very much. Uh, and I think it's, it's worth to mention that the, the report uh, will be available uh, via BPO network. And for those of you who are from the Baltic ports and who are uh, or who wish to uh, to supply an information about your plans uh, for such a report, please contact Emil and Motors Foundation team in order to, to get uh, more fresh information. So it's it, it's really a, a very nice piece of uh, work. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Emil. Now I would like to to come back to Thomas and uh, Thomas. You will present a case study from uh, Stockholm. How you deal with uh, uh, with onshore power supply and uh, uh, is it a, a good method to reduce emissions uh, or not what are the challenges please the floor is yours seven eight minutes please thank you very much uh, bogdan and uh, it's a pleasure to to join you for this webinar uh, discussing this important issue Let's see if this works okay so onshore power supply in the port of stockholm has been something that we've been doing for well, since the 1980s, and as we had Emil talk about uh, the, the low voltage installations, that's the ones we've had since the 1980s. They're still in use uh, in the port of Stadsport and for ferry traffic to Helsinki, but as uh, Emil pointed out, it's a bit tricky to, to um, <clears throat> apply them on the ship, so there are a lot of cords to, to connect to each other. Uh, we have high voltage installations in the port of Nynesham and uh, the port of Vattahamn for ferry traffic to Poland, Helsinki, and Tallinn. Uh, now, why OPS? Well, first of all, it's it's a question about our own environmental targets, of course, uh, regarding air quality and climate change. But we also see increased customer demands. Uh, and I, I, I'd say that a year ago, or a little bit more than a year ago, I don't think that, that all of our customers had noticed the, the, our customers has noticed their customers' customers uh, demand for, for these solutions. I think just for the last year, it's increased dramatically for our customers' customers to have these OPS solutions. It's, of course, good environment for local residents. Uh, it reduces emissions and noise. Uh, and for our owner, uh, which is the city of Stockholm, uh, the objective is to have the city fossil free, free by the year of 2040, and this is one way of doing it. Now, how do we then do it? Well, we, we work with uh, a couple of different ways of, 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 of uh, incentivizing our customers to, to build, uh, to, to, to rebuild their ships or re retrofit their ships in order to accommodate for this new technology. Uh, we work as a port according to an action plan for expansion in the short and in the long run. Uh, the action plan prioritizes actions considering environmental benefits, economical investments, customer demand, technical issues, and available power levels, of course, which is important. The incentives, uh, vessels in regular traffic are rebuilt for OPS. They get a grant from the Port of Stockholm of 1 million uh, Swedish kroners. And we also use environmentally differentiated uh, port fees to reward OPS. The benefits is, as I said, the significant decrease, uh, decreases in, in emissions to air, uh, lower noise levels, uh, and um, the electricity that we use here comes from renewable energy sources, which is important. Now, there are a couple of challenges here. One is high investment costs. Uh, uh, I'll get back to that one. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we can't use imperative measures, so we can't say no to ships that can't uh, can't uh, uh, connect. Now, in the port of uh, Vattahamnen, <clears throat> it's been in uh, installation since uh, 2019. It's uh, we have an OPS solution 
preferred traffic for Helsinki and Tallinn, and it's uh, the largest in the Baltic area in terms of electrical power, actually. So we have two connecting points uh, in operation today. We uh, connect and disconnect within five or 10 minutes. You can see the yellow one there. Uh, uh, it, it's constructed for OPAX uh, purposes. It's high voltage. Uh, the frequency is 50 Hertz. The power in use is six megawatts, two, two times three megawatts. Uh, and there is an additional 16 megawatts uh, available, but not in use yet. Um, this is working very good, uh, very good at this tier. Uh, and and uh, it's been a very successful venture together with our customer Tallinn Silia in, in realizing this. We have, of course, uh, in the new port that I mentioned, uh, Stockholm Uvik port opening in 2020. It's well, the, the railroad part will open in September, but the container part is more or less open uh, as we speak. Uh, the keys are prepared for OPS here, of course. Um, we have a couple of projects on the way. Port of Kapelkoe, ferry traffic to Nantali. Uh, it's an application that we've made together with Nantali regarding OPS for Finlink in the Port of Kapelkoe uh, for their, their new ships. Uh, for the port of Stadsgård and, and, and the purpose of, of uh, OPS connecting cruise ships, we have an application together with Aarhus, Copenhagen, Malmö, Rostock and Helsinki for a joint commit, uh, commitment uh, for a sustainable development of shipping in the Baltic area. Now, just a few reflections. <clears throat> it is easier to install OPS in new ports uh, and when you reconstruct a port uh, in, in our case, it's been uh, both in Vaktahamn and, and in Norvik, when we built in the solution, it was more, well, it was more cost effective and it was easier to accommodate for, for the needs that we needed for OPS. Uh, there is often an upgrade, uh, a need to upgrade the power, which makes the investment costly. So it's not only the investment that you do as a port owner, but you also need to, uh, you, need, you need to make sure that the the power supply that you get in there is, is enough. Uh, it varies. Um, we've had a debate in Sweden about the capacity of the, electric, uh, the electrical system. I basically say that, uh, well, for the cruise ships, when the need from the society is at its peak, uh, the cruise ships aren't there. So then the cruise ships doesn't need to, to use the electricity. And for the ferries, of course, if sometime, uh, the need from the rest of, of the city is bigger, then you can always start the generators on, on, on the ferries. So I don't see that this capacity issue is such a big issue for us. Uh, it's an important thing to have a continuous dialogue with the ship owners and other ports involved. Uh, we, we prefer a technology neutral approach. Uh, other solutions can achieve the same effect. And what, basically what that means is that there are some of course, a big debate about hydrogen, fuel cells, battery or biofuels. Uh, all of them are, are, well, more or less aiming at the same thing. Uh, but but we, aim, we aim to try to find technology neutral approaches uh, in, in, in the investments that we, that we make. So I'll stop there. Thomas, thank you very much. Thank you for, for this uh, uh, presentation from Stockholm. I have one question from the audience. Mm -hmm. The question is very easy. Who paid for all these investments, OPS investments in the port of Stockholm? Uh, the OPS investments are paid for by the port of Stockholm. Okay. Very so, short answer. And, and <laughs> yeah, uh, well, the investment, the investment. Uh, is paid for uh, by by uh, by the port of Stockholm. But then, of course, we need to we need to find, and that's what we're doing. We we are using the port fees, uh, so the customers are, of course, in the end paying for the investment. But the initial investment is made by the port of Stockholm. Thank you. And the other question is: uh, Do you see, or are you planning any postponement of this investment due to the? You know, coronavirus uh, impact on, on, on passenger traffic and cruise traffic. Uh. No, I'd say, 
I wouldn't like to do that. Of course, of course, looking at the cruise, the cruise, the investments that are related to the cruise industry, we need to evaluate where 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 things are going. Uh, so it might be a bit delayed, uh, but not postponed. Uh, I think it's it's important that we take these measures because they are also measures of rewinding or getting back to 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 normal again in, in, for, for the cruise ships. So I think that it's 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 prudent if if it's possible to make the investment in order to make sure that when the cruise industry bounces back, uh, they can use this onshore power supply because they they had the cruise industry has done a big thing in rebuilding and sooner than we thought I believe uh, quicker um, so so more more ships are actually available for OPS today than, than uh, I think most of us believed uh, about a year ago. Okay, Thomas, and maybe the last question from my side. Are you expecting any cruise ship this season? Uh, well, no, the fair answer is no, we don't. Uh, if, if we're going to have anything, I think it's going to be concentrated to, uh, to the regional market in the Baltic area. Uh, so. Uh, Perhaps we, I mean, we hope that we can have some, some German visits, uh, but but it's too it's too early to say really. But yeah. but we're we're we would be happy to to see uh, at least some activity in the cruise segment during this year. Thomas, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And uh, all the best uh, for your new investment. I know it's open already for for container containers container yeah. ships, but yeah. you still. Uh, uh, doing your, your, your part and, and uh, to accommodate uh, ferries, I, I suppose, Ropax vessels in autumn this year. Yeah, in September. Yeah, yeah. we were very happy. The first trial run we had, Hutchison did a, a marvelous job despite Corona crisis and everything. So when, when uh, Unifida came last Wednesday, they actually managed to get about 17 lifts uh, an hour. Uh, for the first first uh, ship, that's that's amazing. I think during these trial trial troublesome times. Congratulations, Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now it's uh, is a turn to go to our panel discussion, and I would like to invite, I would say, to our internet podium, uh, Jorgen Nielsen, CEO of the port of Trelleborg. Jorgen, are you with us? Jorgen, are you with us? Yes, I am. Okay, very good. Uh, I would like to invite Heidi Nelson, Head of Environment in Port of Oslo. Heidi, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And Jordi Torrent, Strategy Manager, Port of Barcelona. I am here. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for being with us. So maybe starting with uh, Jorgen, uh, how is your port doing? How are you? I was listening to your movies at uh, uh, LinkedIn and, and it seems to be that your port is keeping busy, but if you can say a few words. Uh... Yeah, uh, yeah, you could say in one sense, we could say it's a business as usual, but of course that's not really the fact. If we go to the freight business, I would say we, we have lost between 15 to 10 percent for April and May compared to last year. But when it comes to, to uh, passenger traffic or personal cars, that kind of business, we are down with 80 percent. Uh, we could see it's a little bit better in May. So let's see what will be the outcome in, in, um, in June. Uh, but overall, we could say we are still on the plan for investing like we have planned. So in that sense, uh, everything is OK. Thank you very much. Heidi, how is life in Oslo and how is the uh, port of Oslo doing these days? Well, it's uh, quiet. Uh, usually I'm looking out on the city port of Oslo, very close to the city hall area and where it's usually bubbling with tourists and a lot of uh, activity at this time of year. But now with no cruise ships. And also very low passenger traffic. It's uh, it's slow here, but in the south port, the cargo is as usual, uh, similar to Trelleborg. Less cars, but uh, containers and uh, and building equipment is still running. Thank you. 
and Jordi, how is Barcelona football uh, team doing? Have you started already? Uh, no, uh, I think by next week, uh, next week, I think the, the league resumes, football resumes again with the empty stadiums. And um, when it comes to the city, um, activities resuming uh, progressively. And uh, we have um, tourism is stopped completely, as you know. And when it, but the shops are opening, etc. When it comes to the port, and we say we have three ports in one, let me go from the best to the worst. The logistics activity zone has worked uh, more or less as usual um, during the worst weeks of the crisis. The warehouses, as you know, all over the world have been really packed. So the logistics activity zone is doing very well. When it comes to the commercial port, passengers, ferries, crews, 100% decrease. And not it hasn't started, obviously. When it comes to containers, 10 between 10-15% decrease. Finnish cars, we had a stop of 90% decrease. Now the activity is resuming because the factories in Spain are uh, progressively reopening. And liquid bulk did very well. No, the tanks in the port are extremely uh, full, and solid bulk minus 15%, 20% as a summary. Georgi, thank you very much. So it is quite a lot. Uh, we wish you the best from uh, from this part of Europe. Jorgen, can I uh, come back to you? And of course, we we need to talk about onshore power supply in ports. I think it's a very good setup of. Uh, uh, of port representatives uh, from the Baltic, from Oslo, and from Barcelona. But Jorgen, if I can ask you, uh, have you noticed uh, any reduction in air emission and noise pollution since the implementation of the sh uh, shore power installation in port of uh, Trelleborg? And are you planning any next installations? Could you describe that? Uh, yes, we, we can see a reduction in, in air emissions and also in noise pollution, of course, but uh, we, we also need to have in mind that we have, of course, done a lot of other things, a lot of other activities within the port, so you, you can't measure that it's only coming from the onshore supply, but, but I, I would say that we have uh, given to all the, the, the ferry owners the possibility to, in all berths, has, uh, they, they have this possibility to use it. But of course, uh, as I said from the beginning, we, we will have it also now in the new uh, berths that we are building. We are building four new berths. We will have the possibility to have uh, OPS in that system. So, uh, yes, uh, I think that uh, you can see a lot of reduction, but I can't say it's mainly coming from the OPS system. Okay, thank you very much. And maybe I can also ask the same question as to Thomas, uh, who pays for, for these installations? Is it your investment? It's our investment in the port. And of course, I have the same answer as, as Thomas had. Of course, we will bring over the, the cost for, for the electricity to, to, uh, to the uh, ferry owners, of course. But uh, it's we, we who take care of the investment. And you said that uh, you have those investments uh, on, on each of the berth. Uh, and uh, are the shipping lines really using it? No. And uh, that that it's uh, that is a, a big problem, and uh, I would say that uh, uh, for me the, the the environmental things that we need to do it's uh, not local, it's global, and for me it, of course it's a problem that uh, we in Sweden we have very low prices for the electricity if you compare to other countries. That means, for instance, we have two vessels using this here in Sweden in Trelleborg. But when it arrives in the ports in, in Germany, uh, the, the prices for the electricity is uh, quite higher. That means that they are not using the onshore supply when it comes to, to Germany. In that sense, I would say it's no good investment because you should use it in the same way in the both countries. That's my view of it. But do, do you have any, um, any instruments, any tools to push shipping lines to use onshore power supply? Uh, yes, we try to do that uh, in that sense, of course, that we, we, we can do things for the cost or the, the, the prices that we have in the port. But uh, 
you also need to remember if if you are buying new vessels that 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 is quite easy to have this kind of system into them. But if you have a little bit older fleet, uh, it's a uh, quite high cost. And if you don't, uh, if you, if you can use it here in Sweden, but it's too expensive in other countries, then they can't uh, have this. Um, yeah. The, the cost in the, and, and the investment is not going in the same direction. Thank you very much. May I go now to Port of Oslo to Haiti? Heidi, I know you, you have a few slides. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and you are wishing to share these slides with us. Uh, please do that, but I hope it won't take too, too long time. No, this is, uh, can you see the Port of Oslo on the slide? Uh, no, I cannot see it now. Well, I will talk instead. I think that what's important is that, um, what's important? is that uh, if I could hear that uh, Thomas in Stockholm was uh, naming Unifeeder. Unifeeder is also en route to our container terminal. Uh, Trelleborg, you have mostly Roro, I believe, not so much container, but I, my aim is that to get more ships uh, adjusted to use the shore power. There's two things we need to do. We need to have flexible tariffs because the ships are flexible. They can use their engines if the shore power is not there. Thomas, you mentioned some of it in regard to the efficiency and also how much power you actually need. And having flexible tariffs means that mostly shore power uh, will be more uh, economic. Um, uh, a good choice for the ship owners and definitely if you compare it to alternative fuels cost. So having a grid in the port that can supply shore power will always be a good investment for a port if a port has a long term view on it, I would, I would argue. And also in the setting of the European Green Deal, it's to have this infrastructure, Jürgen, you were early. But I think you will you will get payback um, in the in the time that uh, most ships will invest in hybrid solutions to get alternative fuel costs down. Shore power will be part of the equation. So in in and starting with the, the highest emissions in Oslo, it was the Ropax ferries. I believe that might be the same in Stockholm. So that's why you have the Ropax ferries um, in the Baltic also on shore power. And then you will start working your way down. So now we are on uh, bulk. Now we're working with bulk in, in our cargo port. And also there, there is a drive from the cargo owners. Several of the cargo owners saying that they their customers, they demand how much um co2 per unit they are delivering and that means also that the ports need to know what their emissions are on the handling in the port terminal as well to get the right data that the ship owners and the cargo owners need for their own customers so and what will drive this i think the green deal and the, uh, i was glad to hear that uh, isabel was saying that uh, the um, short sea shipping is looked upon as a good solution for getting emissions down from cargo in general and transport in general. Uh, this is a main port that we have raised in many uh, situations. And uh, if it's sinking in at EU level, short sea shipping in our region uh, needs to get their own emissions down, but still, we are a good and viable economic also uh, solution for transport in Europe, I would argue. Thank you very much for this statement. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very strong and, and clear statement. Thank you very much, Heidi. I might come back to you uh, in, later on, but uh, now, Jordi, can you say um, about uh, OPS in Ports of Barcelona? If I know the Ports of Barcelona is the biggest cruise port in Europe, 
Uh, so do you have those installations already and, and who is paying for that and, and are the shipping lines are using that? Please tell us. Thank you, Bogdan. Uh, <clears throat> uh, no, as you know, uh, the Mediterranean is well behind the Baltic area when it comes to OPS solutions. Um, when I hear to my previous, the previous speakers, I'm admired of what they have done in the last years here in our region. The number of ports with OPS solutions for containers, Roro, uh, Cruz, uh, very few. And um, when it comes to Barcelona, for instance, we only have one facility for OPS, and it's not uh, for cargo passengers. It's an, in a marina for private yachts, um, those very big private yachts of uh, billionaires that come to Barcelona for repair, maintenance, etc. And this is a mobile facility. Uh, this is the only one we have. Um, but um, I don't know if I have to answer now, but uh, we have decided in our new strategic plan that we are approving to invest heavily in OPS in the coming years. Um, we have a budget approved of between 50 million, 60 million euros in order to allocate and um, to, to develop OPS for the containers and Roro, um, not for cruise. Um, Containers account for the most uh, emissions at the port, despite we are the first port in Europe in cruise ships. Um, but we will start with containers and Roro and cruise maybe may come later. And let's see how we can do it with the COVID crisis affecting so much this industry. Eh? I, I'm not so sure how it can go. Can I just well, add something in regard to cruise? Because uh, we spoke to, we have a, what's called a green shipping program in Norway. Um, that's yeah, where that's what I wanted to back. ask you. Yes, please. Okay. And uh, I just asked uh, Tore Svensson in Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines in regard to the investments in cruise uh, in general in, in regard to now with the COVID and a year maybe without traffic um, and income. And his uh, reply was that uh, the sustainable cruising that they are committed to is a long term project for them. So one year of COVID and all the implications that that has had, um, will, it will take time for the cruise to come back to normal. Uh, but at the same time, sustainability, they're in it for a long run. Uh, so the investments will come on the ships as well was his reply. And I know Carnival has the same view. Anyone else with crews that want to comment? Well, I, Jordi. Yeah, no, we hear pretty much the same, um, the same from the, from uh, the cruise uh, lines, and the same companies, a uh, Royal Carnival uh, calling Barcelona. Uh, I think they have a strong commitment, as you say, on the long term. But uh, one year without traffic, with no income, uh, it's going to delay things for sure a little bit. I don't know how much. Uh, Jordi, just a question to you. What about other ports in Spain? Uh, are they having onshore power supply installations or are they planning to go for it as, as you do in Barcelona? Yeah, yeah, there's other ports like Mallorca, Palma de Mallorca for the cruise industry that is working uh, pretty seriously. And, and all, all ports are, are more or less, I would say, on the same path as we are, Valencia, Algeciras. Um, but we, as I said, eh, we are well behind the Baltic region. Uh, let's hope we can shorten the gap uh, a, a little bit in the coming years. Um, here in Spain, there's several hurdles that are quite difficult to overcome. The price of electricity is one, legislation is another one. Um, but I think ports, as we have done, and uh, my colleagues from other Spanish ports will do, we have to take the lead, commit investments, develop the infrastructure, and push for these hurdles, legislation, price, um, etc., to be overcome. Not to wait for the investment until this is solved. Thank you and very much. also in good cooperation with the users. So finding the best solutions and standardizing the shore power solutions. Uh, those who do have shore power solutions today could have really good input on how the standardized uh, solution should be. So you can run it out into more European ports with a lower cost. 
We also could see in our study that uh, for the container ships that don't use a lot of power and not by sailing and not when they're in port. And it's just, it's a very small step from just building shore power to also building a supply of charging when they're in port so they can sail out of port also zero emission. So, but that depends on the type of ship, the bulks who use more power when they're um, in port, it's more difficult. But in regard to container, I think it would be good to have the discussion with the other Baltic ports who have container to find that standardized uh, system. So it's easier and for the customers to use it, it's easier for the cargo lines to commit to it because they know they will get the same shore power. Uh, and if everyone has flexible tariffs, uh, it's a discussion here in Norway if they're going to continue with flexible tariffs, but I think that's the way in. That's a good start, and that should be at the EU level, not national level. Uh, what do you mean by, by flexible tariffs? You, you mean the uh, environmentally differentiated tariffs for, uh, for ships? No, flexible tariff from the grid. That uh, because ah. the ships, if if uh, the city yeah. needs the power at a different time, they can just disconnect. Hey, the, the last well, the, the next question to you. Uh, I know there is a, a program, national program in Norway promoting um, electricity, but also uh, onshore power supply. Can you say a few words about this national program? Yeah, ANOVA, it's uh, it's an important program and it was really an end of discussion in regard to chicken and egg uh, discussion here in Norway. Um, they started with funding 80% of the shore power solutions. Now there is 82 different shore power solutions in Norway. Not all of them are being used. Same dilemma as Jürgen and Trelleborg. Uh, but there is also 13 high power charging for local ferries and the local ferries here in Oslo just got charging this year. So that's a big industry and that's also a part of the funding. But having a state government funding to actually take away part of the investment risk is important to build this infrastructure. I would go so far to say that... Uh, if you, you started building roads, standardized roads, motorways with lights, uh, in the future, one would think that every port should have shore power and you would need to start in the city ports where there is high density of population close by because it is a real benefit for local emissions as well. Okay. Jorgen, uh, is there any program, uh, national Swedish program promoting onshore power supply in ports? Uh, I wouldn't say that there are so many programs just in the ports, but there are a lot of programs in uh, all other areas, in roads and whatever, railway and so on. Uh, and I think it's important to have uh, that, that you need to think for the future. But normally, I, I would say that that's a quite long way before you can use that kind of investment because everybody talks about the future. But I think it's even more important to do things right here and now. So, so I, would, I would put it like this. Um, uh, I, I don't want to have the vessels in the port more than necessary. Uh, and, and that is positive for everyone. So, so you, because you only make money when you are at, at sea. Uh, and, and because of that, we have worked really, really hard to be as fast as possible for unloading and loading the volumes. And of course, as Heidi said, we are uh, the, the biggest uh, rover port in Scandinavia, and, and we are focusing on that. So I, I don't, I, I understand if you have cruise ships or containers or whatever, they, they are in the port for a lot uh, longer time than than we are here in Trelleborg. I think the fastest time we have right now is 60 minutes for loading and un unloading. So uh, yeah, I think that is the answer in our way, but still we will focus also, of course, of solutions for the long run. And that is of course, OPS and so on. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, maybe the last question uh, that I would like to go around the panel. Are you expecting any other uh, technologies that would be supplied in ports 
for reduce, reduction, reduction of CO2 uh, in next uh, years, next decades, I would say. Or do you think the OPS is the only good solution so far? There are many different solutions, but uh, definitely uh, um, electricity is the most efficient way and there is no loss of energy from supplying to actually using the energy. Um, so it's hard to compete with. At the same time, many of us are looking into, uh, we looked at biogas, uh, which the LNG ships can actually use. They can use liquefied uh, biogas. However, the production and the, the mass that you need to produce it is so uh, vast, so large for, shipping that uh, one container ship uh, down to uh, Antwerp uh, would we would if you used all the sewage in the, the city of Oslo you would still just have one third of what the ship actually needs per year so the amount of biogas is difficult I think maybe the Swedish uh, companies are, are looking into other and methanol perhaps um, uh, ammonia is a discussion here in uh, Ro uh, Ropax ferries. Color Line has a pilot in the green shipping program. And also hydrogen, we looked at that. Uh, if the safety zones need to be large, uh, which is the discussion, uh, then many ports who do not have the area cannot have the production. But bunkering, you don't necessarily need to have bunkering in the port. Uh, I would say the easiest thing for us is to have shore power. Thank you very much. Jorgen, do you see any other uh, solutions uh, instead of onshore power supply? Yeah, I, I, I can see uh, different uh, things, uh, maybe uh, quite a lot what, what Heidi said. I think that we will have hydrogen. I think we will need to have LNG. I think we, we need to have a lot of things that improve in, in a lot of areas. I don't think you could say it, it will only be the OPS. I think, as, as I said, you need to look on all the, the various things that we can use to help the environment uh, here and now, both in a short run and a long run. Thank you. Jordi, the same questions. Uh, in order not to repeat what Heidi and Jorgen said, um, Apart from the, we also take part in research projects with hydrogen, ammonia, etc. We have currently two different things happening in Barcelona. One is some ferries that uh, use the batteries when, you end in, when they are in the port for very few hours, three, four hours. Uh, they work on the batteries, the ferries connecting Barcelona with Italy. And then we have, uh, I know it's not a good solution when it comes to climate change, eh, but we have last year we had approximately 20% of the calls of the cruise ships using liquefied, liquefied natural gas. Uh, and this is good for the pollution in the city, not for, to combat climate change. And, and we consider it as a transition um, uh, transition fuel when it comes, something better comes and until we have OPS ready. You know? But uh, batteries uh, and it is uh, something that is working pretty well when it comes on the short uh, calls of the ferries connecting Barcelona and Italy. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I should present the, the results of the survey that we did during last uh, session. The question was, is shore power the go-to solution for air emission and noise reduction? And uh, the answer was that yes, more than 70% and no, uh, 28%. So uh, majority of people thinking that uh, shore power is, is a good solution uh, for air emission, noise reduction and CO2 reduction in ports. Well, I would like to thank all uh, the presenters, uh, all the speakers and panelists who took part in, in our webinar. I hope uh, you were satisfied uh, with the, uh, with the out outcomes and with the discussion. And the, the question that we wanted to, to put for, for this seminar was what uh, does the European Green Deal mean for ports? If you read it carefully, you can hear that the uh, Commission would like to oblige uh, ships to use onshore power supply. So let's see how it goes in the uh, future, in next years. And I hope, uh, Jorgen, uh, your onshore power supply will be used more by, by ships 
ships coming to port of Trelleborg. Uh, with this, I would like to thank all for being with us. Uh, thank for uh, all attendees uh, who were following our transmission on YouTube. And uh, well, see you next time. And uh, probably in autumn, we will organize next uh, webinars. Thank you again. All the best in these difficult times. Thank you.